and welcome to The Last Looks Podcast, a show where we catch up with talented hairstylists and makeup artists in the film and television industry. We'll pick their super creative brains and find out all the good stuff. Join me, your host, Jamie Lee, in finding out what's what in the hair and makeup departments around the world. Now it's time for Kit Corner, where we shine a spotlight on artists who've created products with the film and television industry in mind. Products designed by artists for artists. Hi, Zara. Hi, Jamie Lee. Thank you for having me on. And you're welcome. Now, you have created a pretty nifty product to help us hair and makeup artists keep our tools nice and tidy on our workstations. Let's talk about the brush block. What is it? Okay, so the brush block is a sustainable range of wooden products to store your makeup brushes, hair brushes, products, glues, removers, and tools. They are handmade by myself using British grown and locally sourced wood from a sustainable timber yard just a short journey from home. The brush block pro was the first product I designed. It has a glue pot holder section in the front to ensure no knocking over of expensive glue, which we all know is rather annoying. It also has slightly raised holes at the back to allow a better view of your brushes. I also designed the brush block mini, which is very handy for storing glue in the front sections and brushes at the back. I designed a wider range of products to store hair brushes, skincare, glues, removers, and essential oils. So I literally have them all over my house now because I'm just trying to pop everything I can in them. That's very cool. So what what inspired you to create the brush block? Well, whilst during my career, I noticed that nearly all brush holders were plastic and often not very long lasting. So one day I was just sat there staring at the holes in a brick and I was like, surely I could make wooden brush holders. So it was that moment I was inspired to create an eco-friendly and sustainable product that would also last a lifetime. Luckily, my fiance is a skilled woodworker and taught me everything I needed to know. I then invested in the machinery and tools I needed and started my business. So trying to live sustainably is very important to me, which is why I also wanted to ensure eco-friendly and biodegradable packaging and a zero waste policy. So the brush block rustic is a good example of this as it uses the natural edge of the wood to create a rustic product to hold a glue or remover and the brushes or tools needed. And during the drilling process, whilst making the brush blocks, a lot of wood shavings are created. So I then recycle these and use in my horse's stables. So everyone's a winner. That's amazing. And not to mention, they look very stylish. I just have to say that. They're a nice addition to any station. Thank you. Is the brush block available worldwide? Yes. So the brush block is available online at thebrushblock.com. It's shipped worldwide and is also available at the pro makeup store Palm preciousaboutmakeup.com either online or in their London store. I've also recently signed an agreement with the Marine Conservation Society now donate 5% of every product sold. So that's another little bonus. Awesome. I would also like to offer the Last Looks podcast listeners a 20% discount on my website by typing Last Looks in capital letters at the checkout. That's amazing. Thanks, Zara. Thank you so much, Jamie Lee, for having me. I'm a big fan of your podcast. So it's been an honor to be featured. Oh, thank you. Today on the show, I chat with an incredible artist, the man who has taught me so much throughout my career, a wig maker, hairstylist, makeup artist, and mentor to many. He has designed some of the biggest blockbusters on the planet. The one and only Mr. Peter Swords King. Picture's up. Last looks. Rolling. And action. Welcome to the Last Looks podcast, Peter. Thank you for joining me. It's a great pleasure. Fantastic. Hey, I wanted to start right at the beginning and um, ask, did you always know you wanted to do hair and makeup? Not at all. <laughs> no, I didn't. I sort of had an inkling I'd be quite a good hairdresser from a very early age. From about the age of nine or ten, my poor female cousins got their hair scraped up and pinned up and curled up. As any time I saw them, and I quite astonished some of the, the grown-ups with what I was doing at ten, huge mm-hmm. sort of '60s updos and stuff. Yeah. So I knew that was going to happen, but then that all got forgotten. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was at school, and I was doing other stuff, and I was doing art, and that. And then I got, you know, got chucked out of school, which was sort of quite a good idea, really. Thank you. In the end. <laughs> And so I, I left home straight away as soon as I got, got tried out of school and I moved to where I live now in Bath in the southwest of England. And 
I got here and I got involved with street theatre. I got involved with big theatre companies. I worked in a pub full of Hells Angels, looking mm-hmm. like David Bowie. Um, <laughs> it was really sort of, but for me, it was very formative. Um, yeah. I got to study sort of 50s and 60s cinema. I would always loved 1930s cinema. And I got involved in a lot of very artistic, weird, crazy stuff. Uh, performed, I used to sing and, and all the rest of it. But it was good. I, I trained as a hairdresser and I did an apprenticeship, which was okay. so was, which was for three years. And I did it in six months. Oh, um, within six months, I was a head technician for three salons. Oh, my goodness. And... I had a great affinity with, at that time, it was perming. No one perms anymore, although apparently it's coming back in. I think they always say that with the perms, and I'm not entirely sure. (laughs) (laughs) Someone's really wishing and hoping that it does and keeps spreading that rumour, but I'd love to see it happen. I think so too. Anyway, so I had a real affinity with colour. I was very good for the business. I used to run around telling everyone they needed colour, and I'd do it and stuff. Anyway, so we used to, it was a very, very sort of quite fashionable salon I worked in in Bath. And Mm -hmm. one day we were doing a whole modelling session, and already, I'd been wearing makeup for years myself, you know, being yeah. sort of, and then everything was fine. But the makeup artist didn't turn up. So they all looked at me and said, well, you can do it. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> and it's where I started. It's, I actually, this is this first time. You just got thrown into it. I got thrown into it. Absolutely. And uh, it's awesome. it was great. And I mean, that's sort of, then I left hairdressing because I didn't like, actually like working in a salon that much. Yeah. Um, it was a bit too run, run of the mill. It was a bit too boy. I, I did lots of fashion shows and lots of crazy coloring and all the rest of it. So I left yeah. and I didn't know what to do. So I moved to Bristol for a little while and mm-hmm. trained as a secretary. Okay. So I did shorthand and typing and all the rest of it. And then came across the fact that because I was a man, no one would employ me. Because oh. secretaries were all women. And I, went job, so I went for a job at Virgin Records and all these places. And they said, but you're a guy. Um, and so it was sexism in reverse, really. Yeah, it's quite, it quite strange. Ways. <laughs> but hey, so anyway, so I was in Bristol. That didn't work, and I was uh, sharing a flat with another friend, another Peter. Mm-hmm. And it's when I was introduced to Peter Owen, another Peter. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then he he had a very good friend called Peter, and so <laughs> there were the four Peters. But anyway, um, and P- the Peter I shared a flat with was m- knotting wigs for Peter Owen. No, I thought you were going to say, say that you started a band with the Four Peters. We should have done. I mean, that was a great mistake. We never did. Uh, the Four Ps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we were not in wigs. And I said, oh, that looks interesting. Can I have a go? And he said, yeah, sure, he's a bit of lace and some hair and stuff. And I was sort of doing that. And then I got to meet Peter Owen and we became friends and stuff. And then he came to me one day and said, I need just the back of this wig knotted in three days. Can you do it? And I just said, yes, of course I can. Mm-hmm. Thinking, what have I just said that? What am I doing? <laughs> I've only just started learning to knot. Anyway, I stayed up probably the whole three days and three nights, but I got it done. Nice. And he was obviously very impressed. Peter was, Owen was very impressed. Yeah. He started giving me other work. And then he was working at the Bristol Old Vic at uh, that, that time, and I went and joined him there. And I started working with them. I was, of course, I was dressing wigs and stuff. Um, what's that? And, what's what? The Bristol Old Vic. Bristol Old Vic. <laughs> yeah, uh, what's very, that? Very famous theatre. It's, it's an 18th century theatre. Oh, it's a theatre. And there's the Old Vic in London, and then there's the Bristol Old Vic. Okay. And, and shows used to go from the Bristol Vic up to the Old Vic and so on. Anyway, oh, no. So okay. I was working with theatre, and that was fun. And then Peter was, he was hunted down and taken over to Welsh National Opera. They made him offer he couldn't refuse. And he said, do you want to come with me? And I went, yeah, okay. So you were doing um, wigs and hair and the makeup? Or? Well, not, I was doing makeup, but not really until mm-hmm. I'd been at the Welsh National Opera a couple of years with Peter. Okay. And they used to revive old shows and they'd, and they'd get in, you know, the director back again and everything and everything had to be sort of redone. And then Peter said, why don't you start doing the revivals, not the new shows, just the revivals. And I went, okay, fine. So that's when I started doing the makeup more and everything. And then it's quickly surpassed that actually a lot of young directors that were coming up and, and d- designers really wanted me to do their shows. Mm-hmm. And so I started designing my own shows through the Welsh National Opera. And that's really where I started designing all these looks and, and creating stuff. 
and going crazy and mad and, and all that <laughs> and having fun. <laughs> we were making Peter and I were making all the wigs with a wig room run by the Welsh National Opera. Yeah, and we each other and said, "Well, why are we doing this for them? Why don't we do it for ourselves?" I was going to say, so you're you're making them, styling them, doing yeah, exactly. the shows. So we left the Welsh National Opera. Yeah, Peter had a bit of an. I think he started the company with five hundred pounds or something mm-hmm. ridiculous. And Peter had. I didn't have any money because I'm a terrible spendthrift. But uh, <laughs> he had the money and he put the money in, and we still made all the wigs for Welsh National Opera. Mm-hmm. But then we could take in other work because by then people were coming to us for film work, beginning of film work and stuff. Okay. I remember we made stuff for Excalibur for Helen Mirren in Excalibur, which oh, was wow. a film made back in the 80s. So we started getting that work. And I, so I was going backwards and forwards, still working at Welsh National Opera. And then I just finished a Mozart opera with a designer called Sue Blaine, yeah. who also designed the Rocky Horror Picture Show, both oh, wow. the uh, theatre and yeah. the film. And Peter although he's a wig maker, he was the one who originally made all the corsets for Tim Curry and everyone else because he was a corset maker before he he was a (laughs) wig maker. And so she said to Peter and I, look, I'm doing a little film. It's not a lot of money. Would you come and do the hair? We've got Mm -hmm. someone else called Lois Burwell who's doing the makeup. Oh, wow. Um, And this is back at the beginning of our careers, and we went and did the hair. And that film was my very first film I worked on called Drassen's Contract, 17th century. Very famous now for the outrageous wigs that we did. So much fun. And that was my first time of working with Lois Burwell. Yeah, what a team, I was going to say. <laughs> yes, I know. Hello. I know. So, and I used to sleep on the floor in her flat. Um, it was all very, very uh, different then. And then she said to me, I'm doing another film straight after with Glenda Jackson. Do you want to come and do it with me? I went, yeah. So I went off and did the hair on that one. Was that another period piece as well? No, no, that was modern day. That was modern day, okay. same Wales. It was the most miserable film, filming in sort of old coal mines in January wow. when it was snowing and it was cold. No one had any money. That's when you learned it was um, not so glamorous at times. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, absolutely. We were filming in literally a two-roomed cottage, as it would have been up in the Welsh mountains and stuff. Um, yeah. But we still had a crew of about, you know, 150 people. Mm-hmm. But there was nowhere for them to go. And you right. didn't have the expense of easy ups or anything there. You just stood in the snow all day, oh, freezing. <laughs> That's all we did. I know. Don't. I was surprised it didn't put me off, but it didn't put me off because I loved no, it. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's why we it. do it. <laughs> exactly. We must be insane what we put up with sometimes, <laughs> although it's not quite so bad now. And so that sort of started. And then I was still with the wig company, and I was with the wig company for a long time. But yeah. sort of films and everything took over more and more. And then I'd also worked with another designer called Maria Bjornsson. Mm-hmm. who sadly is no longer with us. But she said, I'm doing this little show in uh, London called Phantom of the Opera. Do you want okay. to come and do it with me? Yeah. And so I went off to do Phantom of the Opera. So I designed that, which was nearly, I think it might be 40 years ago now. Yeah. Which just uh, seems absolutely crazy. And so I did that. Um, I did a couple of other shows in, in the West End. Uh, but then I toured with opera with the designers that I'd met. They'd go off all around Europe. Mm-hmm. You know, and they'd say, you have to come do the hair and makeup because they're all hopeless and useless. And it's terrible. Oh, um, oh God, I'm going to get so hated for this. Anyway, um, <laughs> but it was, but the Germans were very, 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 fine. You just go into the houses and there was, a, there, everyone was in white, white overalls. And it was more like working in a laboratory rather than doing makeup. And everything was very, very specific. And I'd come in going, oh, we'll do everything differently. And they said, very, very cross. And I go, I don't want to do it like that. Let's do it like this. He said, no, this is the way we do it. And I go, well, I'm going to change that. I'm going to do it in another uh-oh. way. Yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> but anyway, I, did, I, I worked all over Europe and all over Germany and France and, and Netherlands. And I got to live in Belgium, in, in, mm-hmm. in Brussels, for quite some time. And we had an apartment there for, on and off for about eight years. Oh, and I was wow. there a lot because I did a lot of work in Brussels Opera House and in the Antwerp Opera House as well. Yeah, um, and on and off for about eight years, I did some Puccini cycles and got as well else. But in the meantime, as well as doing that, which was really good fun, film work was slowly coming along as well. I was fitting films in between. Things were happening, and theatre was getting left behind. Right, and less and less was I having time to even make wigs. Yeah, because I was off filming and filming and filming. So then it came up to finally when you know I started doing things like when I did Velvet Goldmine. 
which was amazing, by the way. I still vividly remember watching that film in the cinema and just being like, oh, my God. <laughs> I know. I know. It, was fun. it was fantastic fun. I mean, it was really like it was working with Todd Haynes, who's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And it was really like it was a, quite a small crew. Yeah. I mean, there were five of us on the makeup bus doing makeup and hair, and we could do between 30 and 40 artists in the morning. Oh, wow. Just going for it. We used to absolutely fly. It was really good fun. I get sometimes I get a bit bored now. Have everyone expected to have one artist and you oh God, you've got to do two artists, we better get someone else in. I go and I, <laughs> no, I go, funny. no. You can do five in the morning. Come on. Yeah. Get on with it. Because I'm I'm fine doing that, just piling them out. Who's going to stand by and set and all that sort of rubbish? So I suppose <laughs> it's for the caliber of film you were. I mean, i I do quite big films now. Yeah. Um so, so that sort of started off, and then I did um, Importance of Being Earnest, and I did the other one that I do a husband. That was with Kate Blanchett, Julianne Moore, Minnie Driver. I mean, we had all these people, and they were, everyone was sort of at the beginning of their career, really. Yeah. Because I actually think I did, I think I did I do a husband in between spates of working in New Zealand on Lord of the Rings. I kept coming back and we'd have a bit of a break so I'd do another film here and then I'd go back and carry on over there and so that sort of happened so I think I'd already made Kate up when I was when she was in I Do a Husband or oh, I might have got wrong I'd have to look at my my IMDB because I can never remember I Do a Husband it looks like was before yeah before Lord of the Rings it was before Lord of the Rings yeah yeah okay fine well, before it came out, anyway. So I yeah, don't know. I don't know. Being earnest, I knew one of them. We popped in in between somewhere. When you were having the wigs made for these films, I assume you were going to Peter. Oh God, yes, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I still go there now. Yeah, I still go there now. It's changed drastically there now, and I think Peter sort of, sort of semi-retired, not completely, but. He's not there as often. But still overseeing the things that need to be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there are some very good up up and coming wig makers, so That's you know. always good to hear. It is good to hear. Yeah, we've got a couple in England who are amazing. Oh nice. Absolutely amazing, doing beauty, beautiful work. Um, so that's really good. So at that point of mm. Just before kicking off Lord of the Rings and stuff like that, were you still making wigs at that point every now yes. and again, or just yeah, yeah, yeah. occasionally? Mm-hmm. I mean, I know I made uh, uh, Jonathan Rhys Myers. I made all his Bowie type wigs, the blue ones and everything. Yeah, I made those, but um, it's there was just so time, many wigs isn't it? it? Was, yeah. yeah, and it is, and then you got to go to meetings, and because we were down in Bristol, everything happens in London, so yeah. I'd have to sort of drive up and down all the time. So it got sort of a bit more difficult. Yeah, And then finally, of course, I did leave Peter Ray's. It was time to branch out on my own, mm-hmm. um, which I was t- so funny, isn't it? I was absolutely terrified about doing it and thinking, oh, my God, I'll never be offered another job. I know. I, I think know, that. I, I don't know why we do that to ourselves. I don't it's, know. <laughs> it's insane. I'll know. Oh, that's it. This is going to be my last movie. I'll never get another movie. Yeah. You know, suddenly, it's, oh, three have been so offered bizarre. to you. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, I've got to. Oh, oh, oh what, what am I going to do now? I don't know. I know, and then you have that problem. It's just like it's the it's the best problem to have, but it's still a, a stress of like, oh, which one? What do I? Which one do I take? <laughs> you know, and it's like my. It's like when I talk, I said I lecture at school now, and I talk to trainees and all everything else. They say to me, "Oh, you know, it gets easier as you get older." I go, "No, <laughs> it's the absolute reverse. It gets worse because you build up this reputation of being somewhat of a whatever, mm-hmm. and then they they just expect you to turn it on. Right? They have no idea about the stress you go through. So I'm always saying to people, you know. To a certain extent, look at your career, but you've just got to take the film that's going to be the most fun. Yeah. You really have got to. And if that means not taking on the most adventurous one, mm-hmm. then, hey, you know, we all do adventurous stuff. It's, sometimes it's nice to sit back and go, do you know what? This is going to be a lot simpler. Not going to be easy. Nothing's ever easy. But this no. is going to be a lot simpler. You know, and I think that's the way to do it. Well, certainly the way I do it now. Yeah. I think I only just worked that out maybe in the last two years that I wanted to take jobs that I would find challenging but fun. Yeah. Oh, if it's if it's with a nightmare designer or a nightmare director, I mean, I run from nightmare yeah. directors now. Yeah, and that's what happened. I worked with a director that just was yelling constantly, and I was just like, "This is not cool." No, <laughs> like Why this is. You? I mean, within our team, we were having fun, but we kind mm. of you, you had to to get through the day of dealing with this guy having a yell and a scream all the time. You know, and I find it very interesting that a lot of them, I find a lot of the yellers are sort of. 
uh, sort of slightly younger people, not older ones. Yeah. And I just sometimes think it's like they're nervous. Maybe. And it's like you've got to realize everyone's nervous. Mm-hmm. It's not like we've been doing it, you know, for 40 years or something, so therefore it's a piece of – piece of. Um, I was going to say piss. I don't know if I can say that. But, you can say um, whatever you like. <laughs> a piece of piss then. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's it's not – I still take my job as seriously now as I did 40 years ago. Yeah. And it's, you know, you worry. I worry constantly, mm-hmm. you know, whether have I done the right thing, I'm going down the right avenue. I mean, you know, with films that I've done recently, we can talk about, it's just like, oh, my God, I can't. This is the simplest thing to do in the world. And it has turned into a three teapot scandal, you know, and it's <laughs> just crazy. Guys, get a grip. This is modern day. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and everyone sort of gets a little bit. So, yeah, you know, you've got to, you've got to enjoy it. Otherwise, yeah. If you can't have a laugh, then no, something wrong. Oh, no, I, I think now I'm of a, of, a, of, a, of a sort of age or whatever that if something was really, I would just I would walk. I've never walked off a film. Yeah, but I think if it was that unpleasant and everything so not, else, not worth I, it. It's not worth it. No, no, no. Especially in, in my age, you know, sort of getting on sort of for whatever it is. But <laughs> you know, I don't. I wouldn't want to be. Going, oh God, and going back and being miserable, you know, because no. I can never stay at home because I live down in Bath. So yeah, I'm always yeah, either in a hotel or in rented accommodation. And it's like you go yeah. back and you go, ugh. No, you don't want to wake up every morning and dread going into work, especially the the hours that we do. It's insane. You, there's no way. Well, exactly, exactly. You do not want to do that. And I tell yeah. everyone, don't do it. If you're having a really unhappy time, make up mm-hmm. an excuse or something. I don't. You don't have to say I hate everyone and I hate this production. <laughs> but just, just make up any excuse and go. Yeah. You know, uh, and another job will come along. Yeah. You know. I think you, yeah, you've just got to keep your mental health. I mean, that's it's probably some good advice just for stamina of this industry. Is just. <laughs> If you're going to stay in a positive mindset. When I tell people when we did The Hobbit and I said on and off we had breaks, although we didn't because we were coming and prepping the next stuff that we were doing. Mm. I said, you know, that was nearly three years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the prep was insane. And New Zealand's a lovely place to be stuck in. You yeah. know, I could think of far less <laughs> places to be. And I've worked there a lot. And I said, yeah. I know probably I know New Zealand better than I know the UK. Mm-hmm. To you know, because we did so much travelling, and you know, August, our daughter, um, yeah. you know, came over with us and everything. It was, it was fantastic. But we used to have a thing called show and tells, and I said, "What happens is you have a character, mm-hmm. and he's got a new look coming up, or he's got he's mm-hmm. a his look, and we all get together and we look at it and we say we don't like this, we don't like that. Let's change this, and then we do it again. Yeah, and you do that for every character." Mm-hmm. For every look they've got in the film. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, I was doing my show and tell. So my last show and tell was two weeks before we finished the movie. Yeah. And so I'm doing that constantly. And I did that constantly for, you know, 200 and whatever shoot days it was, plus all the prep. Yeah. You know, and sometimes they are stressy going up to that room with oh, yeah. the PT <laughs> it's and like, Fran. It's time oh, yes, to you go up. up the, oh, so I'd up go up, stairs, come on. Yeah. And it's like, oh, God. And sometimes it's fine. And then sometimes it's like, oh, God, and everyone's got a point of view, which is really useful. Mm-hmm. Not sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> just shut up. You don't need to say that just to, yeah. to say something. And sometimes it's just a few changes, and other times it's a complete overhaul a complete, of what's happened. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. oh, oh, and we have to get oh, that done we were, by when? <laughs> I thought we were. I thought we were there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we're not. Okay. Yeah. What, you, want it, you want it a different color, and you want it straighter, and you want it longer. Yeah. And we oh. want to test this again tomorrow. Okay, fine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it is. I mean, but the problem is, I think I, I sort of, you know, stabbed myself in the foot with all that because. I'm very much the kind of guy, and it's to do with my theatre background, I know. It's where I came from uh, in mm. all this. It's like, yeah, okay, fine, we'll do it. Then I come downstairs and see you lot, and I go, oh, my God, why have I just said that? How are we going to do this? Oh, my God. But I've always sort of got ideas. I go, yeah. do you know what we can do? What we can do is, and what we can mm-hmm. do is, you know, yeah. which is sort of important. And that's another thing you try. I try and instill in students is like, you've got to be inventive. It's no good sitting there going, oh, well, it's going to take me another three weeks. And it's like, not interested. That's what they don't want to hear. 
I always say working with Peter was divine, but the one word he didn't want to hear was no. Yeah. Actually, as most directors, not just Peter. Yeah. And it wasn't just Peter at all. Yeah. I can remember, you know, when we're doing Wild Men and we got them all together the day before we were shooting. And I remember him saying, it's not enough people. It's not enough people. And I said, what? He said, no, we need another hundred people for tomorrow. And I'm going... Where are we going to find another 100 wigs? Where are we going to find another, you know, there's no more teeth. What are we going to do? Yeah. So I remember just going to Peter and saying, how are you lighting this? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, there's a very overhead light in the very center of the room, and it goes out. So I said, so those in the back are just shapes. He said, yes. And that's the way we did it. I mean, it's no collaboration. No one would be going around going, oh, well, it can't be done. How many excuse me to get another 100 wigs together in there? Blah, blah, blah. It's like I yeah. remember us sticking bits of old straw in, with clips in people's hair. We did everything. It was ridiculous. It looked awful. But when you see it, it looks great. But it's sort of, you know, it's having a dialogue. And, and that's why it's wonderful to work with Peter, actually, because yeah. he is responsive and understands, but still wants results, but will help you out where he can. So having a rapport with a director like that. So how did you guys end up working together in the first place, like getting that first Lord of the Rings job and going to New Zealand? Well, Peter Owen got approached first. And he said, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> oh, I don't want to go to New Zealand and I don't want to do that. And I, do, I hate all that fantasy stuff. And that. I yeah. said, it's Lord of the King Rings. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to do it. And I was doing something else at the time. Mm -hmm. He said, I can't possibly read that. And I said, well, get it on audio. You know, we had on CDs then. Yeah. He said, listen to it and everything else. Because Peter and Fran had seen a lot of the other work we'd done. Okay. And that's why it was. That's awesome. Uh, and that's, it was literally on our reputation and nothing else. Yeah. And they'd gone around to everyone. You know what they're like? They were so thorough about absolutely everything mm -hmm. um, that they just sort of gone around and said, who's making the best wigs? And we came out trumps. And then Peter flew out first. He yeah. started it up. Mm -hmm. And then I flew out literally two, to, it was the year 2000, January the 2nd, I think I flew. Yeah. Um, I That's still amazing that you it. remember that. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I do remember what I was doing, and I could never repeat what I was doing. But I remember still having a sort of hangover by the second of January. Yeah. And get, you know, <laughs> um, getting on the plane and thinking I'll be I'll be sober by the time I get to New Zealand. Oh yeah, it's a long way away. Ooh, it's a long way away. It's great. I can drink lots of coffee. It's fine. <laughs> but yeah, and then came over. But also, you know, I was brought in as a, as a manager as much as anything else as well, because mm -hmm. they were having terrible problems with the all the makeup artists and stuff on on it to start off with well it's such a huge production in such a small country it was, but, uh, the in the in fighting was crazy actually it was very funny i've looked back at it it's hysterically funny but yeah. everyone was fighting with everyone else because everyone you know no one had done a big film like this in new zealand ever mm -hmm. and everyone wanted to be sort of top dog yeah and i had to, i came in and just shouted at everyone <laughs> <laughs> You got the ducks in a line. <laughs> I got the ducks in a line and a few dropped off. Yeah. But, you know, that happens. That's inevitable. But yeah. it was the most amazing thing. I mean, you know, it's my first time in New Zealand and I just adored it. But it was mm. a great, it was a great time. Absolutely. I mean, hard work and a challenge, I'm sure. Oh, oh God, yeah. But now I can remember saying to you, can you put together this jewellery for a beard and make it work? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> Oh, yes, of course I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, oh my god! I'm thinking, yeah, but you, you know, you did it, and it was fantastic. So you know, and that's the that's the thing I always say to people. I say, look, I'm just a leader, but it's the team that make it. It's always the team that make it. It's not the designer. The designer might have a few flashes of brilliance, maybe, but it's you know, it's got to be a leader, and you've got to have an amazing team of people, and everyone has their strengths and everyone has their weaknesses. I would never expect any makeup artist I work with or junior or whatever to be able to do everything yeah I'd be slightly worried if they could do absolutely everything yeah. it's a bit show-offy really well, it's a bit weird you know <laughs> like stuff but, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's that it's it, it's that of getting a designer is only as good as they, they're the team behind that person male or female yeah I think that the way that you view that has rubbed off on me absolutely and I think it is the way to do it because also through that you take a lot of time to show people how to do things you share your knowledge and it oh, helps yeah. build your team even more I've unfortunately come across heads of department who do not want to share 
their knowledge. Oh, I'm sure. And I yes. find it so incredibly bizarre because it's it's just like, do you not want to have the best team that you can possibly have? Exactly. We've got to share, guys. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And the thing is, you know, and it's like, it's why I became artistic director of the makeup school because mm-hmm. I was getting fed up with a lot of people coming out of makeup school and not being very good, to be honest. And I was a bit disappointed and some attitudes and everything. And I said, you know, I'm not going to be doing this forever anymore. Yeah. I've still got another five, 10 years in me, I suppose. I, I would feel very guilty if I hadn't passed on nearly an, uh, everything I knew. Whether yeah. people use it or not, it's up to them. I think, you know. But Absolutely. just to say, this is what I do, and I do it because, and that's the other thing. People say, why do you do it this way? And I've always got a reason why I do it. I don't just say, because that's the way I do it. Yeah. You know, especially working with wigs and stuff, how they're made and how they're knotted and what directions. And I know. Because and, cause I was a wig maker as well. Yeah. So I do understand it all. And everything's for a reason. It's not just, oh, that's me. That's the way I do it. Yeah. I couldn't think of anything worse. But, you know, if give people reasons, they do understand. They don't have to do it that way. And they might say, oh, no, I'm not going to do it that way anyway. I've seen someone else do it another way, and I think it's much better. Yeah. Absolutely fine. It's not a problem. But it's to impart knowledge. You've got to let everyone know everything and then let them do with it what they will. Yeah. I mean, I am forever, forever thankful at the time I got to spend with you in that hair and makeup room with no windows in New Zealand because oh the my God, first... Oh, the prison, yes. Yeah, the prison. <laughs> the soulless room. They had no windows. Um, but yeah. I had done like a few TV shows mm. and it was King Kong that was the first like film that I had come to help on. Right. And I was an additional, came in, didn't know, you know, I thought I knew some stuff, but nope. <laughs> <laughs> I had never I had never put on a wig like not even a cheap $50 sure. wig like I'd never yeah. done that I'd been doing hair since I left high school but to have you get that group of us show us how to prep the hair to put the wig on put wigs on each other see what it feels like learn how to glue it down and then we spent I think it was like two or three weeks just sitting around that table, we would get a block, we would get a wig out of a box because there was hundreds of wigs and boxes, pull out these beautiful hand-tied lace front wigs, pad the block out, block it beautifully, wash it, finger wave it, set it. And the beauty of all of that was that you were in the next room and any time I had a question about how to do something, you were just like, yes, darling? It's like, how can I help? (laughs) And then you were just you know, so gently show me how to do it. And I would walk away going, okay, cool. I got this and just keep on going. And it was, it was just incredible. Yes. But you see, that's, it's, it's interesting to say that. And thank you. Cause I mean, it, that's a great compliment, but it's like, why wouldn't you do that for someone? No, that's, what, that's what I don't get when people are like, what do you mean? You can't finger wave. What do you mean? Oh, you're hopeless. You're useless. You know, it's all that sort of attitude. Yeah. I think it's just some deep insecurity in there, maybe. I, I don't know. I don't Oh, yeah, know. maybe. But I mean, I could say I'm insecure. Well, yes, I'm sort of insecure, but I'm not afraid to admit it. That's, right. I think, the thing. I'm not, afraid, I'm not, I'm not afraid of going, oh, God, I can't do this. Then, of course, yeah. you can, but, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, exactly. There's a lot of mysticism around stuff. Well, actually, it's not mysterious at all. It's really quite simple. Yeah. But people want to make it look mysterious, I think, so that they sort of they can retain control and everything else. When you when you're thinking of getting into this industry, you're just like how it does seem so so clouded by yeah, mystery. Like say, how do I get into there? How do I learn how to do this stuff? How do I it's like why is nobody Going, this is how it's done. Come and join. <laughs> yes, exactly. I remember I remember years ago when I always did a film with Uma Thurman called The Avengers mm-hmm. based on an yeah. English series. Yep. Yeah. And I can remember I was her personal and there was all these big red wigs and there was two versions of her, one with big hair and with, with yellow contact lenses in and all the rest of it. And I remember the first day I went in and we're doing her robot. Uh, you know, her android, um, Uma Thurman, Emma Peel. Yeah. Um, so big hair. She was in this amazing sort of black all-in-one, huge heels, blah, blah, blah. Looked amazing. Mm-hmm. And I was doing her makeup and hair. And mm-hmm. I remember she, I did her makeup and she said, oh, that's great. Thanks very much. It's lovely. I'm going off to get dressed. And so I went on to set. And I went on to a set on a big movie, 
good 350 people all around. Never mm-hmm. worked on a big movie in my life. And I walked on set and I didn't know one person. Mm-hmm. Not one. The only person I knew on the film was Uma Thurman. Yeah. That was it. And I remember going, oh, my God, what am I doing here? <laughs> God, this is so scary. It's you know, like the first I've done day quite of school. a bit. I've done quite a bit, but you know, like, oh God, I can't, I'll go over and get a cup of tea. You always mm-hmm. talk to someone by the tea, and that's always jolly. Yeah. Um, and I went over, and I was standing there having a cup of tea, just looking. And someone from very kindly, and it's why I'm always kind to people on set. They came and said, "Oh, are you Uma Thurman's makeup and hair person?" I went, "Yeah." They said, "Come over with us," because you look oh. lost. I said, "I am." <laughs> they said, "Come over with and." And then it was fine, oh, and nice. it was great. Yeah, um, and it was the kindness of other people because yeah. sometimes you know going on set, especially your first time, anyone on a on a big film, mm-hmm. it's sort of really intimidating. Yeah, it's overwhelming. You've got a million people knowing exactly what they're doing, all mm-hmm. running around. Of course, they don't know what they're doing at all, really. No, we all know that now. They're all just <laughs> blustering like everyone else is. Yeah. But it always looks so efficient. It's so scary. People shouting and oh, like that. And it's and I say to my students, I say, look, because I always take my students on to a film that I'm doing at the time if I'm doing something in the UK. Oh, that's um, cool. Well, it's really cool. And they come in and I say, you're not going to stand here and watch and make cups of tea. I want you to fetch a kit and I always get them to do something. I say, you've got to do something. You're not going to stand around like a load of lemons. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> and I did that. I did that actually, funny enough, I did that when I was doing Through the Looking Glass. Mm-hmm. And we had the big ball upstairs before she goes down through oh, the wow. mirror. And yeah. uh, so it was all it was beautiful. I loved it. period. It love great. All these hairdos and all the men had to have facial. Yeah. Well, there were some people there who have been doing it for quite some time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was, I sort of got, you know me, I straight into the, in, into the extras room. Yeah. And going, what's going on? You're taking so long. You had, they all meant to be on set now. And there's another 30 men standing there. So I just turned around my students and said, right, set up anywhere you can, find mm-hmm. a surface, start. They're all going to come with a moustache or sideburns or something to stick on. Yeah. Stick it on. And, of course, our students went straight to it, did it, stuck them on really well, put the noses out of joints of quite a few people who've been doing it for 10-plus years or much longer. Yeah. And they, said, and they were going, <laughs> oh, I, I bet they fall off. I said, I don't think you will, actually, because they have been taught. But, you know, I taught them. Hello. What an what attitude doing. to have in the first place. Oh, I bet it's not gonna, they're not going to do any good. It's like, what? Oh, Exactly. Like. <laughs> you know, it's just like, the notice for now, because they took too far too long. Stop faffing. They're mm-hmm. in deep background somewhere. What are you doing? I mean, that's the other thing I get cross about. You know, when you're working with Peter Jackson, it's different. Everyone yeah. has to be ready for a cam- close-up, because you mm-hmm. never know where he's going to put the camera. Yeah. And, of course, they did a really good job, and it was great. And then the people turned around and said, oh, actually, they're very good, aren't they? And I said, yeah, they are. I said, you've got to put people into this industry, new people, who actually can do something. Yeah. And not be a case of just, you know, they'll stand there for the next three years holding your brush and making a cup of tea yeah. and cleaning them afterwards. And I hate that. I think I would have been in there, like, my attitude would have been like, ooh, fresh blood. Who who's 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 good? Let me watch. Yeah, who's good? Look <laughs> up. Yeah, look up people. And yeah. they, they do, and you certainly know because I know we have. I think our success rate of working in the film industry or working in theatre or whatever is eighty five percent from the school. Um, That's awesome. Who've gone on to actually have careers. They've yeah. all got careers, um, which is absolutely brilliant. I think you giving them that experience of actually seeing what is possible and what they can work towards, like being on a set like that, yeah. is probably so inspiring that it gets their button to gear, doesn't it? Because if you haven't been on there and seen it, you can't quite get that vision in your mind of what you want well i mean that's it i mean you know it is a case of you know in a kind way but throwing them in the deep end because you're either going to sink or swim yeah most people do swim occasionally a couple sink it's inevitable and it's a shame but and i find that a lot of the time it's not it's not the capability of the artistry is a problem it's the uh, psychology of being able to actually get on with people yeah, I mean, because this is the other thing. I do lecture very heavily about it. I said, look, you've got to get on with people. You've yeah. got to be able to mix in and have a laugh because if you can't, forget it. 
Yeah. You, know, you need to work on your own on very small projects where you mm-hmm. have total control. Yeah. You, if you're going to work on a film, you know, you're not going to like every single person you end up with, but, no. you know, more often than not, you've got to get on with all these people and you've got to have a good time. Yeah. So you've got to have a personality that is outgoing and, you know, and, and that. That's why I say, look, when, when you're at the college or before, you've got to go and get at least a Saturday job. Yeah. You've got to be out there and be able to work with the general public because that's sort of who you're dealing with to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. When, especially if you're working in the crowd room and stuff, you're working with the general public. Yeah. And this is where you forge your social skills mm. of how to deal with people, how to deal with people who are difficult, how to deal with people who want to chat too much, you want to shut them up because you can't get on with the work. And yeah. so this is where you learn. I mean, this is the whole point. I said, well, you come to the makeup school for 16 weeks and you come out of that – ready to start learning about makeup and hair. Yeah. You know, yeah. You're, not, you're not coming out going, oh, I'm going to make up Nicole Kidman tomorrow. No, it's like a launch pad, isn't it? And I think if you haven't had, like, uh, for someone like myself or anyone that's worked in a salon, that's where you gain that experience of dealing with the general public and, you know, that having a clientele and the next person in your chair, next person in your chair, next person in your chair, and kind of having that conversation and but being able to work and talk at the same time and get it done and on to the next. Absolutely. I mean, I'm still guilty of chatting far too much. We all have our moments. (laughs) (laughs) I'm terrible. But, you know, I am aware. I am. But, you see, at the same time, I work much quicker than most people. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a certain person I was doing on a certain film, and I can't say, but, you know, they (laughs) worked on on a a, a film before that, and it was taking them, taking, it took nearly just three hours to do her hair and makeup. And I did her hair and makeup myself because before it was two separate departments. Yeah. And I was doing the whole thing, and it used to take me 40 to 45 minutes to do the whole thing. You know, it's it crazy. Means, <laughs> and then she could come in nearly two hours later. Her call was nearly two hours later than before. Oh, my goodness. You know, she'd come in, sit down, I whacked her. She used to fall asleep, so it was great. I could do all her makeup while she was asleep. Yeah. And I had to speak her up to do her hair because her pieces had to go on. Then I airbrushed and got notes her hair and everything. So um, that's the thing I really love doing now. I've really got big into airbrushing hair. Yeah. I love it. I love it. In what way have you been doing that? Well, I mean, you know, when big hair do's and stuff, mm-hmm. I shade. Uh, yeah. I shade the hair. You know, it's dark mm-hmm. at the roots, it gets light on the top. And I just I did it on this on this character. I shaded all her hair. Yeah. So it was a flat. And I just do it a lot now. And I go, any problems? Oh, that color's not quite right. I said, just airbrush it. Just airbrush it. Yeah. I think that's the beauty of you having the, the makeup background to be able to, you know, move that product over to that tool Absolutely. over to the well, hair. I, I, we had in a film I did recently. That's not out yet. And the, uh, it was playing a young version of the main character. Mm-hmm. And the main character has red hair. Yeah. And this guy came in and he had sort of blondish hair, but it wasn't red. Mm. So they said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I haven't got a wig. So I'll just airbrush it. Yeah. They went, what? I went, okay, fine. I literally five minutes, his hair mm-hmm. was red, had a fantastic quiff. Yeah. Done. And they all went, oh, my God. I'll tell you what, though. What? <laughs> what product are you using? Because I feel like there's a gap in the market for some type of it is. decent. I, mean, I, I use Illustrator. Yeah. I use Illustrator, basically. I make up on my own colors. Yeah. And I make it quite thick. Yeah. I mean, you've got to make sure you get some something kind of iridescent in there too, don't you? Like that has to have a little bit of shimmer. Shimmer in it. Like, yeah, I always mix in a tiny bit of gold or a bit of silver or a bit of copper. Yeah. But, yeah, I have a huge case now of just all the liquid colors, and I just mix my own color. I think it would be great to uh, – someone needs to make something that, like, that does hold like Illustrator but doesn't – because you can still really kind of feel it on the hair a bit sometimes, can't you? What I do a lot is I spray and then I comb. Okay. And then I comb it all through afterwards. And if this comb comes off, it's something, it's something that flakes off a bit. But it does actually stay really well. It does stay well. I guess you can put a little shine to finish as well, right? Yeah, I, I always, I always. Now, my favorite thing is, and it's like a case of, you know, I can't live without, you know, I can't live without Kleinol hair shine. I can't even get it in England now. You can only buy it in Germany. 
Oh. Which is really annoying. So it's an aerosol spray, right? Yeah, it's an aerosol spray. But yeah. it's not like there's there's a stuff called Glisker made by Camp Schwarzkopf, I think. Mm-hmm. But that's just like liquid grease. Okay. And that's really, I mean, you end up with an oil slick and you have to be very yeah. careful. With this clinal hair shine. It used to be mm-hmm. called Moonshine a million years ago, <laughs> um, which I, th- I think is better myself. But anyway, it's called Clinal Hair Shine. And you can stand there with a spray and spray and spray and spray and spray, and it never turns into an oil slick. It's incredibly light, but, you know, I do. I use it on everyone. I use it on everything. I mean, I, if I think, you know, as you were saying about what's your, your must-have yeah. product, whenever you're doing hair and you just want to put your fingers through it and you don't want to put a product in, I mean, this is the other thing. Some people get completely product mad yeah. and I don't like it. With this stuff, you blow dry guy's hair and then I would just go an overall spray quickly with this Kleinol stuff and then put my mm-hmm. fingers through it because right, it gets yeah. on your hands and you just push it through the hair. Mm. that's it and it never looks greasy it just looks like it's real hair always been my go-to product and i do get nervous if i haven't got any around <laughs> yeah. you can make the most terrible wig look better yeah but that's with that stuff you know because you know some wigs come in and they're really dull yeah and dead you gotta give us some no, life you have to get some life and, and and that's what i, I always use that's awesome. So with your incredible resume, um, yeah. what would be an absolute highlight that has kind of stuck out for you? I guess more in the experience of actually shooting the film. Right. Okay. Well, then I have to say one of them has to be Velvet Goldmine. Yeah. Working with Todd, making a rock and roll film. Brilliant. Was, and we were like a family <laughs> when mm-hmm. we'd finish work on a Friday night or even if we work on a Saturday. We'd, there was a whole clump of us that would all go out together. Yeah. And we'd party all together. And we never sort of really did not see any, each other. Yeah. And it was a real, it was a camaraderie. Because it was hard film to do with a limited budget and, you know, not having had have millions of staff and, mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that. But it was a real challenge. I loved it. You just, when you got in in the morning, no matter what sort of hangover you had from the night before, (laughs) you know, you just had to get your head down and go, right, well, I've got five people in. You've got four. You've got Tony Collette, Liz, so you're going to be quite involved. But can you do two of the other rock musicians? Because everyone, all the men, everyone was wigged. Mm -hmm. Everyone was wigged, apart from Eddie Izzard. Yeah. And, and Eddie's I didn't have makeup, but he had normal makeup on. And I said, I cannot believe you're doing a whole film with men wearing so much makeup. <laughs> They're wearing more makeup than the women. And you are on this film. And actually, you're not wearing any. Bizarre. And he said, I know. He said, it's so ridiculous. It's so backwards. I, but, it's so backwards. But it was, it was great. And I remember the first day we were shooting, for working with Sandy Powell doing costumes. Yeah. We had the best time i'd known sandy for a long time but we did this film together and i'd lived the 70s so it was sort of like just going back and going back through my mind of everything we did yeah you know but i did a, i did a, i did quite a few fittings for her she'd say peter can you carry on with the fittings i've got to go and have a meeting and i go yeah okay fine mm. and the guys were so funny the guys wouldn't believe it when i said we well, lie down on the floor and you hook a wire coat hanger through the zip of your flies and pull it up <laughs> He said, but I can't breathe. And I said, that's good. That's how my mum used to do her jeans. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, everything was so tight. We yeah. were, I think it must have been all man and nourished or something. We're all tiny, tiny, tiny. And, yeah. and he's this guy joking. He said, I can't get up. I said, I'll pull you up. He said, I can't walk. I said, you will be able to walk. And if not, just stand there and look pretty. It's fine. <laughs> That's what you want to do. You know, this is, this is a film about lots of gay guys and lots of makeup and everything. Um, first day, we had this show for this big black guy, mm. and I gave him this Marsha Hunt wig. It was his huge fro. Yeah. It was fantastic. It was about 15 quid, you know, but it was so teased out. Yeah. And he had these, and we put these great big, huge sideburns on him, and he had these fantastic gold Elvis Presley sunglasses. He just, and I remember Todd going, oh my God, is the rest of the film going to be like this? I went, yeah. He went, oh, God. I said, look, Todd, all you have to say to you is when I've gone too far, tell me. He went, okay, fine. He never said a word. That's brilliant. Never That's said, what no, you want. That's fun. <laughs> and it was fun. You know, there was even a time when I remember, and this guy came in and he had really, really short hair. Mm. And I went, oh, God, that's not really 70s, isn't it? Yeah. So what I did was I got a lot of table tennis balls and I sprayed them different colours and stuck them to his head. <laughs> 
<laughs> and Todd said, oh, my God, that's genius. I said, well, I remember someone doing that. <laughs> oh, my God. Having, and there's all these images came out. So, I mean, yeah, it was, it was fun. It was, a sh- it was short-lived. It was, it was so rock and roll in so many ways. It was, it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I don't think I've seen it since it came out. Like, I need to watch it again, I think. I was looking at pictures of it the other day and just going, oh, yeah. that's right. Oh, my God, I need to watch it again. Yeah, so I know. Great. I know. No, it's good. I was going to ask you, just going back to wigs and wig making. Yeah, sure. And for somebody who is wanting to get a wig made or designed and they're just the back and forth with the wig maker, like what advice would you give somebody? I guess what what do you do when you're designing a wig for the wig maker? What steps do you take to achieve that end result? That you're Well, I mean, my first thing is I take a wrap. Yeah. Now, I am very specific about how heads are wrapped. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, so you know my process of sort of preparing the hair for a wig. Mm-hmm. So what you've got to do is when you're taking a wrap of the shape of the head, you've got to prepare the hair how it's going to be under the wig. It's not a case of just scraping it back and, oh, it's just about the hairline. Yeah. It certainly isn't. So you've got to take, put that hair up how you're going to do it once you start filming. So when the mold is taken of the head, it's the right shape. Yeah. When you put the cling film on, it goes down to just above the eyebrows mm-hmm. and you keep it on and then you start applying the sellotape and you go right down to just above the eyebrows and so you can get the whole hairline in. Yeah. And it's very important that that is very tight on their heads. Mm-hmm. It's really important. And before you've done that, you've gone around their hairline with a normally a, a black eyebrow pencil mm-hmm. and you've outlined everything, including every last hair. Then you do that. Then you put the cling film over. Then you've got a line to follow when you've finished putting all your sellotape on and you follow the line round. What you don't do is what so many people do is then cut round the hairline. Yeah. Because you have now lost all the tension on what's going to be your wig and how the lace is going to sit. Mm-hmm. So you leave it all raggedy and awful. Yeah. That's how the, when the wig maker gets it, he knows how the whole forehead is. Yeah. So how he's going to make the lace. So when you pad the block up, as you were doing, you know, with us when we were doing King Kong, mm-hmm. you actually pad up from where the lace is going to be uh, right the way through to the back. Um, and you always take a series of measurements. I mean, the thing is, what I would do if it's possible is get the wig maker to come and do the wrap. Yeah. So you want to wrap the hair the way it's going to be wrapped under the wig every day that the talent's yes. wearing it. But if you yeah, can absolutely. get the wig maker to do the the shape, do the wrap, the wrap of it's it, it's absolutely would, fine. But yeah. you know, you've got to get that really tight. You really, I mean, if you want to convince people that this is not a wig, mm. you've got to make that head as small as possible. And then you've got to make that wrap so that wig really. As you know, you know, with Peter Owen and that, the mm. wigs will literally, you think this isn't going to fit, this isn't going to fit, and then suddenly the back goes in, you go snap. Yeah. And you're going, I mean, this fits so well, I don't probably have to pin it. I will. Yeah. But, you know, it's just going to sit like there. Butter. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, and that's the important thing. It's in that foundation making. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're unsure, mm. what I would then do is once they've made the foundation, have a foundation fitting. Okay. So the hairline has now been traced in with thread and everything else. Mm-hmm. Put the hair back up again and put it on because that's if you're going to have any problems, that's the time to sort them out. Right. If you've made it too short at the back or too long at the back or whatever, you should have a foundation fitting. And then once you've approved that, then they could go ahead and start making the wig itself. Yeah. And then there's a bit of back and forth with hair color, texture, direction, all that type of thing. See, I do that all in one go. Yeah. I go through everything. I say I want a natural crown, mm-hmm. natural swirly crown. I want an omni top, which is the whole top is knotted, cross knotted, the whole thing. So you can put a party anywhere you like. Yeah. So you don't have to say the party is going to be here. And then the actress says, oh, no, can I have it half an inch further up? And you go, yeah. no, you can't because it's been knotted <laughs> with that parting there. Yeah. And you're a nightmare. Um, so you always try and leave yourself open as much as you can. Yeah. Um, so sort of what we call an omni top is that sometimes I say, no, just straight off the face because I know it's going to go into a bun or a ponytail or whatever. Yeah. And then I would do that. So know what you're going to finish up like. Have a vague idea Mm. that, you know, that's why you've done a design and it's been approved by the director and the actor or actress and stuff. So you know, you can change it, of course, but you know what your fundamental 
look is going to be yeah and do it like that and then you've got to get it back in enough time that you can style it you mm-hmm. can have a fitting if you, they need to change the color you can change the color before you go into doing a makeup test i've got a junior working with me now who worked in a salon for 10 years yeah so any coloring i say oh back it through fine highlights through the front oh change, can you can we do that but then of course then the other thing is i'm always dipping you know my dipping thing with fabric dyes yes not with hair dyes yeah, uh, I have one makeup designer who I used to work with. He that's all he does now. He dips. Yeah, I mean, he, I taught him how to do that. That's very cool. And and it's so quick. Yeah. I mean, I was working on Venom Two, and with um, Woody Harrelson. Okay. And he said, I'm not sure about the color. Can you make it a bit brighter? And I went, Yeah, fine. He said, How many days? I said, Oh no, give me, uh, give me half an hour. I'll block it up, I'll, I'll dye it, and then you can come back and have a look at it. He went, what? Half, what do you mean half an hour? <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. And the actual dyeing takes me three or four minutes. Yeah. You know, and... Get the pot on the stove. <laughs> get the pot on the stove. Here we go. Boiling. Oh, that's the smell of vinegar. I can't bear it. I know. <laughs> but the thing is also, if you use hair dyes, unless you're really sure of what you're doing, mm. you really can't change it unless you're going to start using Epsilon and strip it all out and start all over again. Yeah. By this time, you end up with sort of chewing gum hair. Yeah. Um, with my thing, I just put it in um, pre-dye, take the color out I put in, and put another color in. I can do that again in sort of four or five minutes. Yeah, easy. Um, but that's my history of wig making because that's how we dye all the hair. We never use, obviously, hair dye. And, I mean, you've got your color recipes down and you've been doing yeah. it for – I mean, I've been doing it for since forever and I just look at something and go, oh, needs a bit of jade green, needs a bit of purple, oh, yeah. a slight touch of this, and put a bit of yellow in there. And like that. Really People look at me and go, this is alchemy. And I say, well, it is to a certain extent because I put all these strange <laughs> colors in this pot yeah. trying to make, a, make another color. You were the first person that showed me how to boil here as well to curl it. Oh yeah, I know yeah. pre-curl. I yeah. mean, I, I mean, a lot of people do do it now. Mm. Um, a lot of people do pre, pre-curl, um, which is really good. I mean, it's great. I mean, it's the only way to do, you know, do really good afro hair if you're going to if you're not going to buy it. Yeah. But if you've got, you know, if you've got some straight dark hair, it's the only way you can do it. I mean, you have to twist and 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 wind at the same time mm. on orange sticks on teeny it's, tiny it, on teeny tinies but it yeah. works and i mean what i love is i remember we were doing a week for nutty professor yeah and if he's afros and because we straighten all the hair before we start knotting with it it's much easier obviously mm-hmm. so it's all straight hair so it looks like when you finish the wig it's great because you've got this lovely straight wig that's quite long and yeah. as soon as you dip it in water the whole thing goes why and you've got this <laughs> tiny little afro on the on your hands <laughs> It's so cool. As once you've boiled it, that's it. Yeah. It's It's done. That's so amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's like all facial now. You know, I don't have any facial made unless it's pre-curled. Yeah. Because a lot of the time, I don't tongue anymore. No. I do it with water and set it and just let all the curl do itself and maybe tidy up a few edges. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it looks more natural than something that's been tonged to death and looks like something out of a Greek tragedy. (laughs) You know, and you're thinking, this doesn't look very natural to me. You know, so (laughs) China, and China, it's easy. You put it on a block at night, spray it with water, whoosh it up a bit with your hands, done. Damn. You haven't got to sit there for three hours with a pair of tongs swilling them around your head going, are they, oh, they're too hot. Oh, I've just burnt it. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Oh, this white, this white moustache is now yellow. What do I do? Yeah. Mm, you know, and it's all that sort good. of stuff. <laughs> no, it's not good, no. I just wanted to get you to explain, just because we've been talking about the Academy, so it's BAM, right, which is Bath Academy of Media Makeup. Of media Makeup, that's right, yeah. And Bath being a place, just for people Bath who are not Bath England. is a place yep. in the southwest of the country. So the course is a 16 weeks. Mm-hmm. Of of it's, it's not a taste of course because we go more than that. Yeah. But it's a case of you. We do a lot of hair. Yeah. I am insistent on what people do hair. Yeah. Um, and I say to them, I say, listen, if you can do makeup, great. If mm-hmm. you can do makeup and hair, you're more popular. Yeah. <laughs> you're more likely to get work if you're good, especially if you're good at hair. Mm. It's it's really important. Everyone thinks about makeup, 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 makeup. I'm going. Your dime a dozen. But if you can do hair. And you become good at hair, 
you'll never be out of work. There are people who will fight over you. I fight over people. Yeah. I have to offer them more money than they're being offered by other people <laughs> just to come and work with me. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so we go through everything. We do black makeup, black hair work. We have uh, an actor who comes in and talks to the students about what it's like to be on the receiving end of what they do. Yeah. And um, we have a financial guy comes in who tells them how to do the spreadsheets, how to manage their money, what to do, how to do you know, the tax and mm-hmm. everything else. They are told everything, what to save, where to save it, That's as well brilliant. as doing all period, all period makeup, period hair we do prosthetics we do small wounds big wounds because it's fun but yeah. you know i i'm very insistent that they know how to do a tiny little cut mm-hmm. it's what you get called to do more you don't do get to do many severed legs yeah but you do get to do wounds you know fresh wounds old wounds fading wounds scabs yeah and i get, get them to do a lot of that because it's like this is important this one don't come here and think you're going to do sort of you know people having their arms and legs chopped off and god knows what else yeah um you will never <laughs> be asked to do that yeah unless you go into um you know effects mm-hmm. it seems to be a bit more of a specialized thing these days doesn't it it is and so if you really want to go and do that yeah off you go go to neil gorton or wherever yeah and do that but so many, i said so many people want to do you know gore fest and everything mm-hmm. i said you're, you're fighting a lot of other people and some people are really good yeah, I think you need to be really passionate about it. I remember figuring that out early on with my makeup yeah. career that I was just like, I think if I wanted to get into special effects stuff, I'd really have to be like a geek about it to be no, you do. to get anywhere with it. I mean, I have found a fantastic <laughs> prosthetic guy I work with in England now. He's fantastic. He's just really, really lovely. We work very closely on witches, which will be coming out sort of Halloween this year. Oh, the Roald Dahl witches? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Awesome. Yes. That's exciting. That was fun. God, that was hard work. <laughs> God. Where was that shot? In England? In England, yeah. Over yeah. at um, uh, where Warner Brothers. Yeah, we started at half past three in the morning in the crowd yeah. room. Wow. We started at five o'clock on the main bus. Yeah. And for particular looks, we did just under four weeks of doing that every day. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was insane. You would have but hit it, it down, it, though. It was a great challenge, and I think we've worked out some really good stuff. It was fantastic. That's awesome. And uh, who I worked with, Christian, he was just genius and really relaxed. That's nice. You know, and not taking himself seriously. Yeah. You know, which is refreshing. Because, mm-hmm. you know, you've still got a person, you know, I mean, you might be fantastic at what you're doing, but there's still yeah. a person underneath it, you're putting it on. Yeah. You know, so... So that was really good. I mean, remember we did, I did Venom 2. That's yet to come out. Obviously, I only just finished that before I started um, Little Mermaid. Oh, The Little Mermaid? I know. Well, I'm now waiting to go back and carry on with. Yeah. We were down to last two weeks of prep and all this happened. Oh, so you haven't started shooting yet? No. Oh, so you're just at the starting line and you then you oh, yeah, yeah, that's annoying. But we've done all the makeup tests. Yeah. I'm looking after Melissa McCarthy, who's playing Ursula. Oh, is she fun? I bet she's fun. Oh, gosh, she's so much fun. Yeah, I can imagine she's you having some fun. She's the nicest person, <laughs> nicest person on earth. And what we've done to her is like, oh, my God, I didn't even know I could do that. Amazing. That's awesome. Cool. It is awesome. Oh, God. You wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but everyone, we got We're going to have to Bard- wait so long. It hasn't even been I made know. yet. <laughs> I know. Javier Bardem as Triton. Ariel's oh, father. Wow. Cool. Just so cool. Such a nice guy. I mean, again, a fantastic cast. Yeah. Really wonderful people. Makes um, a difference, doesn't it? It makes it so much more pleasurable to go to work. Can I just say, there's all the mermaid sisters and everything else. You've never seen so much Pat McGrath makeup in your life being used on this <laughs> one. There's your teaser, people. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, my God. Her iridescent colors and i mean just amazing oh that's you know, very so, cool uh, rihanna rihanna sent us loads of her makeup too which is fantastic oh nice um all her body sh- sheens and stuff and we're using everything we're throwing the whole kitchen sink at this one that's so much but fun. i think you'll 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 i think you'll like witches, witches. oh i'm sure <laughs> it's it's good it was great fun to do that's really good fun to do that's awesome 
Hey, I wanted to ask, um, Peter, who would you like to hear interviewed on in the podcast? Uh, who would I like to hear? Oh, my God. Have you, I'll tell you who I really like. Have you got Donald Moat? I know Donald. I worked with him on uh, Blade Runner. So, yeah. Oh, right. I mean, he's lovely because he's such a kind man. Awesome. Um, I, got, I worked with him on uh, Spider-Man Far From Home because he was looking after um, Jake Gyllenhaal. I, t- I like Vivian Baker a lot. Yeah, I've worked with her. I worked with her on Bombshell. She's lovely as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you did Bombshell, did you? I love that mm-hmm. movie. That's good. I love that movie. It was absolutely brilliant. And some of these people have amazing stories of what they and what they got up to, what the business used to be like, and how it's changed. Yeah. How do you feel like it's changed? Oh, I mean, it's changed immensely. Everyone's become very proper. Right. When I started this, I mean, you know, money obviously wasn't mm. big then. It was all a case. It was really like working theatre, a case of everyone just mucking in and getting a film done. Yeah. And now it's all very, very precise. Mm-hmm. And it's very, very perfect. And it's everyone's very sort of, you know, because I can always remember. I, well, I do do it now occasionally, but I can always remember when I went on makeup. I always had two fridges, one for makeup and one for alcohol. Yeah. You know. But no one drinks anymore. The idea of saying, oh, I'll have a glass of wine while I'm, I'm cleaning these laces and blocking things up. People look at me and go, what? Come on. <laughs> and they, go, they don't have the you stamina, know. Peter. No, they don't have the stamina, <laughs> absolutely. But they're all rather, I mean, it's the next generation coming because we were all sort of, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll. Yeah. And all the rest of it. And now the other deadlocks come along and they all sh- uh, uh, shoo everything like that. Oh, it's green juice, isn't right. it? And but- butter bowls and things. I know, stop it, stop it. If I meet one more vegan, I'm going to scream. You know, exactly. Have you found, like, because uh, England is, I mean, because you do both, you do both hair and makeup. Are you yeah, finding right. that that is separating more or is it still no. quite a combined situation? I mean, everyone, does, everyone does it here, apart Good. from a very few people yeah. who separate it. I would be sad to hear if it um, was starting to... No, no, no. Because anyway, you see, of course, the producers don't like it. Because if I need six hair and makeup people, if I was doing it separate, I need ten. Yeah. Five hair and five makeup. Yeah. And they go, how many? And I go, hello. Yeah. Mm. I said, no, we do both. And we're much quicker. Yeah. And artists love it, which they do. They yeah. come and sit down, they get done, <laughs> and they go. Can you go and sit down there now? Or can you go over onto the other bus now? And when you finish, can you come back to me? It's backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And it's sort of, yeah. you know, and it talks to ADs and it drives them insane. Yeah. When it's separated. I mean, I know it's very normal in America and yeah. I understand that and that's fine, but. That's just what you get used to, isn't it, as well? Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's where you do it. That's where you do it. That's awesome. You know. PK, thanks so much for sharing your story. It's been so great to catch up. Oh, that's been great. It's been lovely talking. Yeah. I do rattle on, I'm sorry. but No, never apologise for that. Okay. I love it. <laughs> if you'd like links to more of Peter's work, including his Makeup and Hair Academy, go to our Instagram at The Last Looks Podcast or visit the episode notes page on our website, www.thelastlookspodcast.com. The Last Looks Podcast would like to thank Brett Stanley and Sabrina Castro, the song Fun Time by DJ Quads. Thanks for listening. Until next time. That's a wrap, people.